Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. William Ogden is credited as being the first bookmaker in human history, now more commonly referred to as a sports bookie. The American Gaming Association estimated Americans wagered a grand total of $4.76 billion on Super Bowl 52 alone. In this episode, I'm going to tell you a story about an individual that started off as a bookie and would end up being the catalyst for two out of the three Super Bowl losses for Tom Brady. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to Come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Now as we step off our DeLorean, we are in New York, New York. Yes, the Big Apple. The Big Easy. Oh wait, not the Big Easy. It's just a Big Apple. It's the biggest city we got, man. This is America. And the date is July 29th, 1887. You see, this is the day that our hero of the story was born. This time our hero is Timothy James Mara. Now it's kind of a important deal to remember that he was born in New York, New York, but let's uh, skip a little bit further into his childhood. The Hall of Fame mini biography that they always put on there had to point out definitely that he had no college, which, you know, at the time wasn't as prevalent as it is nowadays, but it was still a big deal for what he would go on to accomplish. Now, I couldn't verify this without a doubt, but it said that he had to quit school at the age of 13 to help support his mother. His first job, according to the article, was an usher in a theater. Then he would go on to become a newsboy selling newspapers in the streets. You know, that whole, hey, mister, I got the newspaper here for you. You know, the Godzilla just attacked the city and you know those kinds of things and whatever and stuff. But what really ended up turning him into what we are, the reason why we're talking about this guy right now, as he came into contact with many New York bookmakers. And that's that bookmaker kind of term again. Now, you and I know them as bookies. I'm not really judging, passing judgment on anybody. I'm just saying. Most people have heard the term bookie. So what he did at that young age was he was a runner for the different bookies and the New York bookmakers back in the day, where he would earn 5% of the commission. But he's all like, you know what? I'm going out on my own. By the age of 18, he was an established bookmaker himself. Now, it was a little bit easier back then because it was, from what I understand, it was legal. But still, he had this kind of foot in the door as far as sports world goes. But it still wasn't like, you know, heavy into football. But I have to imagine that it had to fuel his fire, you know, to be in the sports industry and ultimately end up becoming a huge contributor and pioneer in the NFL. Which brings us to the New York Giants in the NFL. At the time, back in 1925, the NFL was what they called in its Neanderthal era. But that didn't stop Tim Mara. He took an opportunity to purchase the New York Giants franchise for $500 in 1925. So finally, 1925, we have a professional football team in the nation's largest city. And it would help possibly the NFL getting a chance to become on the same ranks as the college football world. but. They had a long ways to go. Now, there was a quote from his son, Wellington, about the purchase, and it goes as such. My father said, how much is it? And I'm not sure if it was $500 or $2,500. And granted, at this time, he had never seen a football game. And they told him what the price was, and he said, well, an empty store with chairs in it is worth that much in New York City. And that's how he became a professional football magnet, end quote. And Tim Mary himself said, a New York franchise to operate anything ought to be worth 500 bucks. 
So that's what he did. But he didn't stop there. He would end up investing another $25,000 in the first season. And that's a pretty good chunk of change back in 1925. And there's this guy that's going to pop up. You see, the original team had an aging Jim Thorpe. So they had that kind of, you know, big name status. Yeah, sure, he might be past his prime, but at least we got this face of the team. And they would play at the Polo Ground Stadium. We've talked about Polo Ground Stadium in this podcast a few different times. But one of the big ones that we talked about back, was actually happened back in 1925. The team would end up going 8-4. and four. They were fourth out of a 20-team league. And still, college was still far more popular than the professional ranks. But then there's this game that we talked about. Now, if you remember, the Giants were going broke as a joke, man. And they needed a Hail Mary. You know, not one of those just little peewee football kind of Hail Marys. They're talking about Aaron Rodgers tossing that in the sky and ripping it down to one of his receivers and just breaking the hearts of every other team against him. And you know, that kind of Hail Mary. They had to draw on the fans. And there was a gentleman who they could count on. Red Grange was the answer. So Mara tried to get Grange, you know, to play for the New York Giants. But he signed with the Bears. So he's like, fine, I'm going to still get Grange in my stadium. He would challenge the Bears to come to New York. And they would play in front of a sellout crowd for the game. And Mary would net $143,000 for that game alone. That in 1926, Mary was going to have his first kind of like interleague rival. Where we talked about again, Grange and CC, you know, cash and carry pile. They started the New York Yankees and the rival American Football League. This did cause an issue for the Giants and Mara. Now they were losing fans and money. And it wasn't just necessarily because they were not putting on a good show. I mean, they still were the Giants, but you're dealing with Red Grange over there against the New York Yankees, and no matter what, you're going to lose some of your fan base. So they would bore the brunt of the fight against the AFL. But as we found out earlier, the Yankees in that new league, they're like one and done kind of dudes, you know, MC Hammer style, out of business. And Tim's all like, ho yo 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 can't stop, maritime. And they didn't stop. They would proceed to succeed in the following year. The Giants would win their first championship after the year that they had to, you know, bore the brunt of the fight against the AFL. They would win the championship with an 11-1-1 record. Now, mind you, again, this was all based on record. They didn't have no playoffs, no stinking playoffs. We found out about that last episode. Didn't happen until the mid-30s. So, here we are. Another famous moment that I gotta talk about. Remember that sneaker game? Yeah, sure. That happened at the Polo Grounds. I mean, it wasn't a little, it wasn't until later, but still, you know, we got to bring it up. Well, let's get back away from this. You know, we talked about all these things many a different times, and let's get a little weird side tidbit. A story from Lizette Mara, who was his wife. But it comes through the lips of grandson John Mara, and he tells the story as such. The story goes my father, no, this is Wellington, who is Tim Mara's son, came home from a game at the polo grounds with a cold. The giant's bench was on the shady side, so my grandmother insisted my grandfather move the bench to the sunny side. It's been there ever since. We're one of the very few teams in the league that still has a bench on the sunny side of the field. End quote. Now I know that has nothing to do with football or any of that kind of thing. I mean, I guess it kind of does with the bench and everything, but it was just, think about it. This is how new the, the whole kind of thing was as far as football goes back there in 1925 and such. The wife of the owner, granted the wife of the owner in many kind of avenues has a lot to say, but still, something as simple as the sun being on the field and he gets a cold and they're like, move that bench to the other side, man, to the sunny, I don't care what those players say. A little bit different than nowadays, but that was a long time ago. And because that was a long time ago, Tim Mary passed away on February 16th, 1959 at the age of 71. So unfortunately, he was unable to you know, be present when he was inducted to that inaugural Hall of Fame class in 1963. There was a quote that came from Tim Mara, and it went as such. Getting a winner, or building a winner, isn't easy. It requires experience in the front office, long-range planning, shrewd promotion, careful appraisal of costs, and luck. End quote. But I do have another interesting fact for you. Speaking of the Hall of Fame, Tim Mara passed the torch to his children for the Giants, as far as owning them and running them and all that kind of thing. And his son, Wellington Mara, ended up also in the Hall of Fame. He was in the class of 1997. Now, a father and a son, both in the Hall of Fame. Now, how cool is that? How often does that happen, you know? But Wellington also had good company. His college buddy was Vince Lombardi. Vince was the godfather to Wellington's son, Stephen. So it's like this whole 
big dogs in the NFL world. It's like they're all this inner circle. But there was not anything else that I could talk about as far as football goes. He was the Giants owner. He brought everything together. You know, they were going bankrupt. He brought in Red Grange. He kept the game going and all that kind of thing for the city. And it had to be there. Like I said, the Big Apple, you've got this big city, the biggest city in the nation. Everything, the heartbeat goes through that city. So if you didn't have a professional football team, it would have been very hard to really truly get this professional sport on the map. But even though, yes, professional football was huge for him, there was something else that he did beyond being an owner and administrator. And there's a story that tells me that he should be in the New York City Hall of Fame as part of the Citizen Hall of Fame. Now this is from the Professional Football Hall of Fame website, and the story goes as such. Mara had known hard times as a youngster. So when New York Mayor Jimmy Walker approached him in the Depression year of 1930 about playing a charity exhibition game, he quickly agreed. The Giants defeated the Notre Dame All-Stars 21-0, and Mara unselfishly turned over to the New York City Unemployment Fund a check worth a little over 115 thousand dollars i hope you enjoyed this episode of the football history dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets of the founding father of the storied new york giants in an upcoming episode we're going to hear about another early pioneer burt bell but for now dudes i'm through if you're through thank you for listening to this episode of the football history dude to make sure you're the first to get the next episode Please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.